So down the road, you know what I think happens? We keep going like this. Fed will drop rates at some point. They will start buying bonds again for their portfolio, by the way. And that will increase reserves and increase bank deposits. And then around 27, 28, we get a maxi reset in housing. And it goes back down to maybe, you know, 22 levels. Think about that. So everything that's produced between now and then is going to end up underwater. Chris Whalen, Whalen Global Advisors Chairman, author of Institutional Risk Analyst, and also an investment banker. It is great to welcome you back on the show. It's always great to have you on, Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Julia. Well, I can't think of a better day to have you on, especially with all of the big banks reporting uh, fourth quarter earnings. So before we get to the bank, so let's just get an update from you, Chris, on your big picture macro view, your view of the economy, and also let's throw in markets there as well. Well, the markets, obviously, the interest rate markets rallied uh, at the end of December very strongly. You will be amused to know, Julia, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were two of the best performing mortgage stocks in the United States. There are people who think that the Biden administration may suddenly release them from conservatorship, but I don't think that's going to happen in the real world. Both of those entities are totally postal by this time, you know, 15 years under government control. Um, but, you know, the macro environment is basically, as we've discussed before, the commercial side is where the pain is. I think you're going to see a number of bank failures this year, uh, which is why maybe Vice Chairman Barr should reconsider his uh, stated intention to shut down that lending facility they made available for the banks last March. Um, I think there's still mostly going to be pain on the commercial side of the ledger if you think about the economy, so commercial real estate, corporate defaults, that kind of thing. The consumer is still relatively quiet. Uh, if you look at defaults on cards and autos, it's pretty low. And then residential mortgage, especially for banks, is still negative in terms of net defaults because home prices keep going up. My friend Ed Pinto at AEI says they're going to go up another 5% a year for the next couple of years. So down the road, you know what I think happens? We keep going like this. Fed will drop rates at some point. They will start buying bonds again for their portfolio, by the way. And that will increase reserves and increase bank deposits. And then around 27, 28, we get a maxi reset in housing. And it goes back down to maybe you know, 22 levels. Think about that. Mm. So everything that's produced between now and then is going to end up underwater. Mm. Wow. There are a lot of areas I want to dig in there with you. And the smarter lenders, I know, by the way, the privately owned <laughs> ones are already backing away from conventionals. They don't want to write loans. Think about that. Yeah. They're very happy. They're going to sit there with their big servicing books. Uh, by the way, I noticed you retweeted that post I did this morning. Jamie dropped half a buck worth of servicing in the last quarter. I think he's been selling because of Basel 3. So very interesting. Mm -hmm. Explain that too, because I saw it, even his remarks around, um, he brought up Basel 3 um, in game. I know you've commented on it. Explain that real quick. Well, Jamie Dimon is, uh, as of last year, when he bought First Republic, was the largest servicer of residential mortgage loans in the United States. He had passed Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is very deliberately shrinking. They are backing away from being a third in the mortgage market, which is what they were. Uh, in fact, they rescued the mortgage market in 2010 and 11. They stayed, and they provided credit to the industry, and that was very important. So now, you know, all of them are looking over their shoulder at the Fed and the Basel crowd, and they see punitive capital uh, charges being placed on residential mortgage servicing. So that means they're going to be sellers. They have been sellers of mortgage-backed securities for the last year. Banks have been big sellers, and you hear the commentary among our friends on the credit side, right? There's no buyers. So they were even asking the Fed to come in and, and start buying again. But uh, Chair Powell doesn't want to buy any more mortgage-backed securities, I don't think. They're going to keep the ones they got for a long time, you know, 15, 18 years maybe. How does all of that affect like the everyday person, maybe the person, the, I don't know, I'm still an aspiring home buyer at some point, um, but <laughs> yeah, what does this mean? Like you, well, I heard you say a massive are. reset 
in housing at some point? Yes. Explain this. Yeah, you're not you're not going to get any relief in terms of affordability for the next few years because, it, especially if you think you know the median uh, mortgage is probably around four hundred thousand dollars, maybe a little bit more, depending on where you are in the country. So. You know, anything above that price may compress a little bit if the economy slows, Julia. But everything below that price, there's no supply. And you have lots of buyers. So when you're talking two, $300,000 mortgages, it's very competitive. And that's why prices keep going up. There's not enough home building, you know, bottom line. Mm-hmm. What's going to cause the reset, you think? You run out of buyers. Okay. The prices get so high. The market gets exhausted, and eventually you start seeing new supply. Okay. That's what takes time. And we can't convert office buildings. You know, I know we talk about that a lot because people are trying to figure out what to do with these legacy office buildings that banks are going to be losing a lot of money on this year. Uh, But the reality is you have to knock them down and start again. I've been uh, listening to the uh, Robert Moses biography, by the way. If you haven't done that, it's wonderful. Uh, and you think about all the stuff he did years ago in New York, we have to go do that again. we got to knock a lot of this stuff down and repurpose it. You know, think about all of 3rd Avenue from 57th Street down to 34th Street. Mm. Okay? And it would be nice if it was resi, but you can't really run New York City on 100% residential, Julia. There's not enough revenue. you got to make peace with the business community and try and get them to come back. Yeah. Ultimately. And the last time you and I spoke, that that part of the equation, that's the consumer. Okay. That's not the consumer side. Excuse me. That is the commercial side. And the last time you and I spoke, we talked about this kind of silent crisis. Where are we in that? I want to hear more on that thesis. Do you still see that oh, one it's coming? it's rolling along. Um, you know, Ambrose Evans Pritchard had a great piece in the Telegraph quoting a bunch of researchers here at Columbia who had you know, done some deep thinking about what's going on with commercial real estate. It moves very slow. It's palatial. It occurs behind closed doors because this is an institutional market. There are no consumers involved, except indirectly, of course, right? So if you have, you know, multifamily real estate in New York, for example, with the rent control laws, it's very hard to finance it. Banks don't want to touch it. They want to get out of it. So, you know, there are certain markets in the country, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, where legacy real estate is basically toxic. And the bank regulators have told the banks this. They've said, get out. Um, You saw the sale of the signature assets, Julia. Um, You know, FDIC had to retain a big chunk of it because they can't sell it. There's just nobody willing to step up. And this is why the Fed's, you know, apparent decision to shut down that bank lending facility even though the banks were using it, uh, is a really bad idea. We need to keep that facility open because banks are still hurting so bad on assets that they created in 2021 uh, that I think it's going to be years before they can dig their way out. Look at Bank of America. Brian retained a lot of his uh, residential loan production from that period, and it has two, two and a half, three percent coupons. Okay, he's going to be points underwater on that portfolio. And little banks who have, you know, losses on commercial real estate, they end up spending all their profits and capital dealing with that, and then they fail. And FDIC has to sell them. So the Fed should remember that they had to come to the FDIC's aid back in March of last year to finance three big bank resolutions. Uh, there's not a line out the door to buy these assets right now, Julia. That would mean that the Fed would have to cut rates a lot maybe a point, point and a half on Fed funds. Imagine that. But in order to fill the room to start selling the assets at dead banks, that's what you'd have to do. Because today at current yields, you know, with the 10-year round four, is anybody banging the table for the assets of dead banks right now? No. No. No, I do want to hear more on this because you were talking at the top of the conversation around um, not only this commercial pain, but the number of bank failures likely to go up. Obviously, um, the end of that bank term funding program. Can we just hear more on that? And is do you when do you think that might happen? Is it as soon as that get that program gets cut off, we'll start to see this? Like, I just want to hear more on that thesis because I feel like it's not something that's getting talked about enough. Mm. Well, listen. Uh, first, Karen Shaw Petru, dear friend of mine in Washington. 
uh, one of the best bank analysts and consultants in Washington, by the way, uh, has a great piece in the Financial Times that talks about this. Uh, we started talking about this a couple of weeks ago on the blog because a couple of my bank friends were like, wow, Chris, you know, we had this interest rate rally and the overnight one-year swap rate had dropped down below five. Uh, with the fee that the, ch- the Fed charges, they charge you 10 basis points to use the facility. Um, it was like 490, and then they could put the cash out and Fed funds at five and a half. So whoopee, the banks were making half a point. But if you think of the money that the Fed has cost the bank industry in terms of losses, hundreds of billions of dollars, this is chunk change. The Fed should be happy to give the banks a little gratuity. Because ultimately, this, you know, it's going to help banks on the margin that they have a place to finance these bonds at par with no haircut at a reasonable rate, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And it really is incumbent on Vice Chairman Barr and Chairman Powell to get up and make the case for why they're helping the banks. Would they rather have them fail? That's really the question. And I put that to a couple of my friends in the system. I worked at the Fed of New York. And I have great love for all of those people. They they bear enormous responsibility. But we got to help them sometimes, you know, Julia. We got to give them a little nudge. Mm-hmm. And this is a time when the Fed should be generous with liquidity. If we have to write off hundreds of billions of dollars for the commercial real estate this year, which is what we're talking about, then the Fed should be putting liquidity on the table right now and leave it there. Because earnings aren't going to be great this year. I hope we go sideways. You know, we're down five quarters now. If you look at the earnings results we've seen so far, Mm -hmm. the sequential numbers are very weak. You know, Bank of America got more than cut in half. Uh, Jamie was down in single digits in the fourth quarter. He was down 40%. So, you know, you have to look at it in terms of where are we going rather than the year we just had, which was good. Jamie went over his record for uh, a full year. I think it had been 48 back in 2021. So, you know, that's fine, but next year is going to be light. Mm -hmm. In the fourth quarter, you should always remember about banks, it's always light, especially if you look at City. City is always very light in the fourth quarter, and then their first quarter results are usually their best. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews, and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support, and enjoy the rest of the interview. Okay, so we had the big banks reporting earnings today, as you mentioned, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citi, and Wells Fargo. My question for you, Chris, is we're seeing all the media coverage come out. Are there stories or angles that you're like, one, they're getting it, the picture wrong, or is there something that's not getting discussed enough from where you sit? I'm always curious because you know this space better than anyone who's come on this show. Well, if, look, the street is always uh, very constructive and the media. And they have to do that because these are their clients. They make money on these institutions. They advertise with them. So they're going to focus on the annual results, which are good. Um, You had a lot of uh, factors this year which helped make it a better year, especially in the third quarter, because credit expenses were light. Everybody reduced their provisions expense significantly. Some of them were even taking money back into earnings. So fourth quarter, all of a sudden, whoop, we're back to normal. And, you know, Jamie Dimon doubled his credit expenses this quarter. And he's talking pretty grim recession. He's talking about credit losses among other banks. He is a big provider of services to other banks. Uh, JP is very important in that sense. They're a huge warehouse lender, both to banks and non-banks. So they know what's going on. They know what's happening with these people. And I think you know, for me, I'm I'm just hoping we can get net income for the industry to go back up. I'm hoping we can start seeing fee income so we can push non-interest income, which is a very important part of the industry. It's, you know, 40% more or less of some of these larger banks. You know, with JP, it's half. Think about it. Jamie only lends out half of his deposits because the other side of the bank is all Wall Street. Um, and, you know, he is the biggest source of cash in the repo market by far. If you think about excess reserves that other people might borrow, 
Um, so it, it's important to keep your eyes on them. But the other four, you know, we just started buying Wells Fargo for our portfolio. Uh, it's the most improved student in the class. Uh, I like U.S. Bank as well, but they're going to have to finish digesting uh, Union Bank of California, which is a huge uh, transaction for them. It, it's made them one of the biggest mortgage players in the country too, by the way. So both JP and U.S. Bank are now top five in terms of one to four family mortgages. Yes, on the economic picture that you point out that Jamie Dimon um, kind of maybe has a bit more of a grim outlook, do you do you agree with his assessment or outlook? I think on the commercial side, very definitely. Um, we don't see it. Um, how do you see it? How do you follow it if you want to? You know, sources like uh, Bloomberg, of course, do credit intensively. There's a great publication I subscribe to called The Real Deal, mm-hmm. which is all about commercial real estate. Those guys are busy. Those folks can't even cover 10% of what's going on out there right now, Julia, because so many properties are being restructured. And I'm not just talking about old office buildings, warehouses. We've had a surfing of warehouse construction. We don't need all of it. So those properties are being re- redone and repurposed as well. There was a fascinating um, uh, piece I saw recently down in Orange County, right along the coast there. One of the big uh, properties was originally going to be an office park for biotech. And you would think, my God, it's going to be fully fully taken up, right? Mm-hmm. No. They just uh, canned the whole project and turned it into residential because it's by the beach. Um, that tells you that there's a lot of volatility out there in commercial real estate. Mm. Huge flow of money in the Florida, Texas, the whole Southwest. But it's getting overbuilt. You know, Dallas is seriously overbuilt. Um, and I think they're going to have to work that out as well. And what it does is it, it takes away from the kind of mid to old properties in the commercial space. Because when you have new stuff going up down the block, everybody wants new, right? The customers want new. So that tends to take the older stock out. And eventually, it's going to have to be redeveloped. So there's this a lot going on. I mean, I spend a fair amount of time in, in Texas during the year just uh, visiting clients. And... It's now the epicenter of the whole residential mortgage industry, Plano, Texas, uh, which is kind of between Dallas and Fort Worth. But that whole area has exploded, Julie, exploded. But downtown, meanwhile, Dallas is empty. It's like downtown Cincinnati. There's nobody there. Yeah. So we have a lot of economic redevelopment to do. We need another Robert Moses or two. Because seriously, we're going to have to tear these assets down and figure out what to do uh, with what were premier properties. You know, think about it. Commercial went up for 75 years. Most of the banks that I rated when I was at KBRA and I work with today, they never thought about commercial real estate. It only went up. And that's why they would do interest-only loans, roll them every seven years, and take some cash out. Now most of these developers have to put cash back in. When the mortgage is rolled, mm-hmm. that that's the tough part of what we're going to be facing this year. You're going to have developers who have to make a decision, yes or no, and if it's no, they're going to walk away. Mm-hmm. They'll they'll hand the property to the bank at fifty cents on the dollar because that's normally what the regulators require, no more than fifty percent uh, loan value, and then the bank's got to see what they can do with the property. Can they sell it? Is it salvageable? And each one is different. These are all idiosyncratic events that you can't generalize about. So you could have a property that's great, and you could have a property right down the street that's not. And that's how that's how difficult commercial real estate can be, you know, when you're in a deflationary environment. That's where that's where we are right now. Yeah, I imagine you speak to a lot of folks in that in that space. Like, what are you hearing from people in the commercial real estate space? What are they saying to you that? might be interesting to this audience well don't don't think it's all bad and don't think it's all good you got to realize that there's an awful lot of great investment and great activity going on in this sector right now a whole lot of it in south florida which always worries me now remember after the crash in 1929 real estate prices in florida didn't recover until the 1970s that's how long it took so I don't see anything like that on the horizon immediately anyway. But um, it's important to say that if you're talking about downtown you know, Los Angeles or Chicago, you probably have a problem. 
because the use case for those properties has changed so much. But then you have a lot of new development in Chicago in different areas, much of it residential. So, you know, you don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but I think the governments in New York and Chicago in the, uh, you know, in the municipal side have a big problem. Mm -hmm. They really do. Yeah. Because you can't turn the business community into enemies and think you're going to survive. The money in New York City, you know where it went? Went to Charlotte, went to Austin, it went all over Texas because they're greeted as friends. They're not the enemy. But the progressive politics in New York have, you know, done a lot to hurt real estate in this state. Uh, we're still kind of coasting on COVID. There are still people trying to move out of the city. So pricing in New York is actually okay. And the volumes are okay. Um, but it's not necessarily going to stay that way. You know, if you have non-performing assets uh, in, the, in the residential loan space, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts are the worst states in the country. Those assets will typically trade at a 5 to 10% discount to the national average because of the progressive politics here. Let me shift and bring up another topic with you. Um, when I was taking notes at the beginning of the conversation, you were talking about um, the Fed will probably have to drop rates, start buying bonds, increase um, reserves, bank deposits. Can I hear more on your Fed outlook? Well, the Fed um, has unfortunately uh, injected a lot of volatility into the markets, really going back to December 2018. We'll recall when the money markets kind of ran out of cash. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the other big banks, had basically shut their books in early December. So the market had no access to real liquidity for three weeks. Uh, the Fed decided at that point that they were going to go big with reserves and make sure that there were plentiful reserves. You hear Roy Logan at the Dallas Fed talking about this an awful lot. And so through 19, they were actually dropping rates. They were forcing mortgage rates down. They were just providing a lot of cash. And there were two events that year that were kind of anomalies, big spike upwards in Fed funds rates. So after that, when we get to COVID, they went big again. And they injected all this volatility into the markets and drove rates down to zero. As you recall, I have a 3% mortgage. Uh, I will probably never, ever be in the money for refinancing unless the world is ending again, right? So the volatility from this period, we're hoping, is now going to end. And the question is, how is the Fed going to manage rates? In other words, what's the new floor in their mind? Is it 3%? Is it 35 so I think what we're going to see is that the Fed is going to probably, maybe by mid-year, stop the runoff of the portfolio, which means as T-bills mature, they're going to reinvest them in more T-bills. And they're going to keep the Fed's investment in Treasury securities stable. That implies uh, the Fed's going to be in buying bonds because they've got a $7 trillion portfolio. Now, two and a half of that is mortgage-backed securities, which aren't going anywhere. Uh, because rates are so high, the prepayment rates on those securities is probably less than 6% a year, maybe half of that in some cases. So those might as well be 15-year treasury bonds. They're just going to sit there. But I think when the Fed is, again, adding or at least reinvesting in their portfolio, it'll make reserves go up. It'll make bank deposits go up. And I think they're very focused on this because of commercial real estate, because of what we were just talking about. And that's why I suspect they're going to ease in terms of the portfolio first. Maybe later in the year, we'll be talking about rate cuts. I don't think Powell's in any hurry. He, he doesn't want to be proven wrong again. You know, December of 2018 was a big embarrassment for the Fed. And the fact that they had to go big after that to make sure we didn't have a problem in the short-term money markets again uh, was a big deal. But then it created other problems. Remember, he had to expand what we call reverse repurchase facilities to keep the money market industry alive. Uh, we have $6 trillion worth of money market funds now. So that's a big piece of the Fed's calculus when they think about interest rates, because they don't want these guys to get in trouble again. And then they're also looking at the banks that so we're going through this Basel proposal, as you mentioned before. Uh, I, I hope they're going to change a lot of it. I really do. I think uh, if the Fed doesn't pull up on some of their initiatives, they could cause a bank crisis. 
And we don't we don't need that right now. Let's explore that. They can cause a bank crisis. Let's uh, tease that point out. <laughs> well, look, if if you ignore the impact of monetary policy on banks and you pretend it didn't happen, um, and then you start raising capital requirements on banks and doing other things, which essentially is going to reduce their profitability, then you're going to have a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, banks don't spend capital to dig their way out of holes, Julia. They spend profits. You know, I remember when BBT, right after 2008, they kind of took their time. They didn't have to do really anything until 2010 in terms of, because they wrote off a little bit every quarter. It's because they were so profitable. They didn't care. They didn't need TARP. They didn't need any of that. They just kept on going. So banks that have earnings power can always get out of credit problems. They, they have the cash to throw at it, right? But if you start limiting the industry's ability to make money, which we've been doing for a decade, uh, then I think you know we could have some serious problems. You know, uh, the, the whole issue of, of uh, both commercial exposures and residential mortgage exposures is front and center in Basel. Mm. If they go through with that proposal, it's going to make home prices much higher, and it will make credit much more expensive for consumers. Yeah. Um, another topic I want to bring up with you, Chris, is just our debt situation here in the U.S. surpassing $34 trillion at the start of the year. What are your thoughts on that? How do you think about that piece of the puzzle? I think I have to reissue my book, Inflated. Hmm. It's been 15 years, but we have much more stuff to talk about. Uh, I think it's a huge problem. I think that as we normalize interest rates, let's hope that we keep short-term rates stable and not move around too much, okay? What happens on the long end, Julia? when Janet Yellen's got to go out with the next refunding. They're in the process of doing that now. I think over time, you're going to see long-term rates higher. So we'll end up with a normal yield curve. But are people really ready for what, say, a 6% 10-year bond implies for mortgage rates? It's going to be seven, seven and a quarter. Um, that kind of structural change, I think, has been in the works for a while. Because since 2008, let's be fair, We've had quantitative easing. We've had all of these uh, policies from the Fed that essentially distorted the money markets. If we now start to see them more normal, and yet we have this huge cash need from Treasury, um, I think you could see long-term rates go up and stay up simply because they can't just issue T-bills. You know, tactically, I think Treasury has made a mistake by funding so much of their cash needs in the short-term markets. Because ultimately, you know, once the bid to cover ratio, which is essentially how many uh, bids they get for a treasury auction, goes below two, that's bad. It used to be well above three. You want three bidders for every bond you want to sell, right? When you only have two, that's bad. Yeah. Well, when, well okay, but I imagine wouldn't this just have like serious implications, though, if you saw rates rise to that level just because of how important it is? U.S. Treasuries are maybe for the global economy. It also makes me think like, well, that, that could probably affect stocks. It can have a lot of implications. Well, it affects everything. Like if you think of the non-bank sector, um, they fund off of midterm to long-term debt. That's where they raise capital. So if you're looking at high yield rates, probably close to 10, if the 10 years are around a six, six and a half, that changes the economy a lot. There's only, you know, because the short end of the market is where you fund relative risk-free securities, commercial paper, that kind of stuff. That's, that's you know, a different world. But term debt at, you know, close to double-digit rates is something we haven't seen in this country in decades. And that's why, you know, the, the deficit to me implies that we're going to see more financial repression. In other words, the Fed is going to keep interest rates artificially low the way they did during World War II. And I don't think, you know, we're going to see an easy solution to this because ultimately, if you get the debt too high, and there's no attention on this in Washington right now, of course, um, then you have to run the economy hot. It will be like Argentina. So you'll have to tolerate 4 or 5 6% inflation just to keep the financial side of the government uh, from going you know, sideways. Mm-hmm. That's that to me is the, the the real issue. Everybody in this country ought to be focused on the budget deficit. I know it's not very sexy, but it has immediate impact. Mm-hmm. You know, Argentina's inflation rate last year was two hundred thirty percent. Okay, so 
Think about that. I, I have a lot of in-laws in Uruguay, and they're benefiting enormously. Because little Uruguay pays its bills, and they have very low inflation relative to their neighbor, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Chris, can I sneak in one more question? Sure. Okay, well, one, um, when you have that new book come out, or the re- re- a revised <laughs> version of it, I want you on the show yeah. for a long discussion on that um, inflated. Well, I've got a couple books uh, I'll I... tease, actually. I've got a bio I'm working on uh, about Stan Middleman, okay. the founder of Freedom Mortgage. It's a great story. Rags to riches. He's one of the most beloved and respected uh, people in the industry, and he's private. He, he's. I don't know that we'll ever see an issuer that big again that just comes from you know, hard work and uh, bootstraps. And then uh, I'm hoping to reissue Inflated. I got to talk to Wiley about that. Mm. You know, I think it's time. Yeah. I think we, <laughs> I think it's such an important conversation. Um, we have to have the conversation, do something about it sooner than later. Otherwise, past the point of no return. So the- well, when I worked for Jack Kemp, I mean, hell, we got fussed over single digit billions in deficits. Now we have trillions. Oh, that's crazy. It's- but this is democracy. Mm. Yeah, but yeah, here's the thing. Oh, the, I guess it would be like if someone like even wanted to do something about. It, I guess the other person said, "See, they want to cut your your entitlements, right?" Wouldn't it just be a lot of like finger pointing? We're going to end up going to a national sales tax. Mm. We'll still have income taxes for the Elon Musk's, mm. but the only way you can fund this country is with a sales tax. Okay, okay. So I want to get my question in now um, because it was at the top of this show, and I haven't talked about this in a long time. But Fanny and Freddie. It seems like there are hopes that they could be released from conservatorship. You say that's not the case. This is like a well, hot no, topic. There are so hopes. I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> well, a very dear friend of mine in Washington, one of the smartest people I know, uh, called me last summer and said, Chris, there are some very interesting people at the White House talking about releasing Fannie and Freddie. And I thought to myself, cool. they, they want the cash. They would love to get them off the Treasury's books and see if they can raise some net cash which they would then give to Ukraine, believe it or not. That's mm. how the story goes. Unfortunately, Fannie and Freddie have been in conservatorship for 15 years. And the people from the industry who had initially gone back to public service to prepare to get them out of conservatorship have all left. And also, unfortunately, both of the entities have been very politicized during the Biden administration. A lot of my clients are not even selling them loans. They're selling their loans to the Federal Home Loan Bank because they don't have to deal with the progressive politics. They literally give you a hard time if you haven't made uh, enough loans to low-income households, which I think is inappropriate. But this is the world of Joe Biden. So I think practically, can you take these out of conservatorship? No, because a week or two before you actually pull the trigger, uh, the folks at Moody's are going to downgrade them to probably a single A+. plus. They can't be a sovereign, okay? Once they're released, they will not be sovereign entities anymore. We can't pretend the way we used to. Remember, 2008, we all winked at one another. Folks at the Fed winked at everybody and said, oh, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that if they're released, they're just like, you know, Penny Mac uh, with an insurance portfolio. And I think they would find it very difficult to compete with Jamie Dimon, who's a double A credit. You know, his bank is a double A plus credit. So he's a big player in private label. He plays in conventional mortgages where Fannie and Freddie charge you half a point for insurance. Would Jamie do that trade for less than half a point? Yeah, he certainly would. So what I'm saying to you, Julia, is I don't think either GSC is ready uh, to be released from government control. Uh, Not at all. They need to think about what the business model of these two things is as a private enterprise because you can't do it the way we did it. In the old days, they traded like the federal home loan banks and everybody just assumed that they were sovereign. But under Basel, under you know, Dodd-Frank and everything else, they would be considered private entities. They have a credit line from the treasury, which is great, uh, but that's not the same thing as being a sovereign credit. And if you read the Moody's criteria for sovereign ratings, you know, Ginny May is sovereign. Fannie and Freddie are not sovereign, and that's the difference. Mm. In the courts, they're treated as commercial entities, typically. Um, And that's why, for example, when there's a bankruptcy where they're involved, they have to enter into the litigation like a private party. Ginny Mae doesn't have to do that because all of their rights are in statute and they're part of HUD. 
So they are, in fact, a government division. Um, and that's the difference. I just don't know that they can function as private entities, really. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure folks will write in on this one. It seems like every time I used to do well, anything, I, I, I sympathize with yeah. the shareholders. They're all the victims of fraud. But the problem is the fraud was committed by Congress. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't. Uh, yeah. What do you do? All right. Well, Chris, I always love having you on the show. I feel like you're like a friend of the show. We got to get you on like at least every quarter because you are just yes, such ma'am. a hit with the audience. And I love we learning have- from you. I want to give you a few minutes. Um, let folks know where they can find you on social, read your work, follow any of your work and any parting thoughts that you want to leave the audience with to think about. Well, that's uh, difficult. Uh, I'm Chris Whalen. I write the Institutional Risk Analyst blog. I also write a column for National Mortgage News where we talk about the deep in the weeds mortgage market. And um, I write books occasionally when I have time. And I do work as an investment banker, mostly focused on mortgage finance and mortgage servicing rights, one of my favorite assets. Um, Parting shots, you know, get involved. We need more people in this country asking those in power why they are doing certain things. I've never seen people with less competence and less seriousness that I see in government today, and I deal with a lot of government agencies, and we need to change that. Uh, It reminds me a lot of the 1920s. This is like the second Gilded Age, and I hope that we're not going to get the wake-up call in a couple of years. (laughs) But, you know, I would not be a big investor in banks, even though I have been nibbling at some of them. But... uh, what can I say? It's going to be an interesting year. Yeah, indeed. Well, Chris Whalen, Whalen Global Advisors Chairman, thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your ideas. Hey, Always great to see you, Chris. Thank you, Julia.